Yeah. 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 Council, you have a proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. I entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Mr. Mayor, if you could, in the discussion, would you mind, uh, due to commitments that others have, that we take item four first, then item three. So your order will be the public safety use of force policy, then murals, then the follow-up on the downtown circulation, and then the follow-up on wayfinding. Is that acceptable? Uh, who made the motion? I did. Do I need to make the changes in our motion? Yes, ma'am. Um, I make a motion that we um, address public safety use of force policy, number one, murals, number two, follow-up downtown circulation, number three, and follow-up wayfinding programs for number four as discussion. Second. Any further discussion? Here, none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. All right, we'll start with the public safety use of force policy. Chair, yeah. members of council, good evening. Certainly my pleasure to have the chief with us today, but also, as you know, Colonel Lewis has joined the staff as the accreditation manager. They have been working for the last several months on a new policy relative to use of force. And at this time, they'd like to brief you on that policy. There is no action requested on your part. This is provided for your information. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Manager. Um, I do appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk about this. And actually, I'm just going to do a little bit of talking and then turn it over to Colonel Lewis because, um, because of his experience with the Marine Corps and what we're, what we're starting to embark with, um, I think he brings some keen insight to, to what we need to change uh, over the next several years uh, in terms of use of force. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about our use of force. I mean, for the last several years, we've seen a, a general decline in that. And there's a lot of things I think that we can attribute it to. Uh, the CIT training the officers are going through, the de-escalation training that they're going, going through. Um, some of the discussions that we've had in the past about how they how they do things, um, and and we've seen a dramatic decrease, about a 53 percent over since 2010. So I think I think we're moving in the good a good direction, but I think there's some other things that we can do to make our policy more effective and to make our processes more effective. Because when we talk about policy, it's just not about the policy. It's about the training that's going to that's going to um, that's going to have to take place in order for us to change the culture. <clears throat> and really, when we talk about uh, re-engineering the use of force, you know, this is the the conventional wisdom. Uh, you know, I know the mayor could probably tell you for the last fifty years. I mean, we've we've taught people like active shooter that time is the critical factor. That we have to make these split-second decisions, and and there are some cases that we do make those split-second decisions, but there's a, there's actually a way that we could probably look at how we uh, approach uses of force incidents, or or these deadly force incidents, and in an opportunity to to look at at it in a different light, and I think this is this is where I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Colonel Lewis and let him kind of explain that and uh, talk a little bit about where we're moving with this process. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, uh, this new approach is, uh, is about uh, using uh, the uh, strongest six inches on the body, which is in between the head, uh, and thinking things through before you make those choices that you're going to make. Uh, uh, you make an assessment of the situation, and uh, you move effective uh, a, a approach to it. You're slowing down the situation. Is there really a reason to speed to the uh, uh, to the action? Uh, uh, there's this term of uh, uh, tactical uh, uh, redistancing or uh, uh, moving back from a situation and, and maintaining some distance between the officer and the subject, and then uh, uh, so that you might reduce the, change, the chance of physical confrontation. And then communication is key. Uh, you, you've got to uh, communicate. The 
current culture is of, 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 of police forces is never back down, uh, take charge, uh, uh, neutralize targets. Uh, and the, the, the training uh, is, is geared towards uh, uh, defensive and uh, firearms and uh, some use of uh, uh, lethal weapons. Uh, but uh, this, this new change is, is, is uh, uh, going against that uh, particular culture. Um, uh, the training, uh, as we rethink and re-engineer this training, we got to recognize that the current training is, is not providing officers with the state-of-art tech, uh, techniques to minimize the use of force. Uh, so the intent here is to, is to do so in, in moving towards this new direction. Uh, the training uh, is sometimes fragmented and approaches makes it difficult to see uh, how training is, uh, is related. Uh, along with that culture is a cur our current policy uh, built out of that culture, which is, focuses on uh, uh, the force, uh, use of force continuum, where you meet levels of, of resistance with the specific police tactics and weapons. And, uh, we know that uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, of the use of force is that uh, objectively reasonable is the measure of, of, of use of force. And that level, and, and objectively reasonable, is that level of force that is appropriate when analyzed from the perspective of a reasonable officer uh, possessing the same information uh, and faced with the same circumstance. Objective reasonableness is not analyzed with hindsight, but will take into account uh, uh, where, uh, where appropriate to uh, the fact that officers must make rapid decisions regarding the uh, amount of force to use in tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving uh, situations. Uh, so we're moving from that, that meeting uh, that level of resistance uh, in that continuum of force uh, uh, with that, uh, with a specific uh, police tactics uh, and, and, and weapons. However, the Supreme Court said that the calculation of reasonableness uh, under the Constitution is not capable of precise definition of mechanical application. In other words, that mechanical movement up is, uh, uh, is, is, is not capable of precise definition. Sanctity of human life uh, is, the new, is, the, is the culture of change that is centered around uh, this, uh, this change. And that is the belief that all life is sacred and therefore precious, so valuable that uh, no one should take it uh, away and work every effort to preserve it. Uh, in other words, respect the value of every human life and that application of deadly force is a measure to be employed in the most extreme circumstances. We move towards this in, in creating the crisis intervention training that is uh, uh, that uh, a lot of forces, uh, uh, agencies are, are adopting and that we've kind of, we've adopted here at, in Jacksonville. And this critical uh, uh, intervention team or training is, is central to the sanctity of human life. It's critical thinking combined with specialized skills and resources to assist the law enforcement officers to uh, incidents involving individuals with mental health. Now, this is different from uh, a, a, a weapon firearm welding. Uh, this is this is uh, some other um, uh, weapon, a, a weapon other than firearms, such as a knife, baseball bat, or, or rocks. And uh, the the crisis intervention training uh, links intense law enforcement training uh, with some mental health the classes, some uh, personality disorder, uh, homeless and crisis intervention, and de-escalation with uh, strong mental health uh, partners, uh, police crisis counselors, and, and, and uh, integrative uh, family services, along with community involvement. Currently, about 60% of our officers have been through that training. Our goal is to do 100%, but uh, currently about 60% of our de department has been through that training. We've, we've had scheduled classes over the last, uh, last two years trying to get all officers trained in the uh, CIT training. How do you 
in, in the real life, life situations. Maybe you could share with us some examples of how you were able to realize that the person was mentally ill. Because when you approach a crisis scene, you don't know if the person is mis mentally ill or not, unless you got a phone call in advance. Well, and then and that is part of the part of the process when we get into the the tactics. That's that's part of taking all the information that you can. But the crisis intervention training does provide for a number of different types of mental illness. So the training includes how 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 we recognize that whether the person is autistic, whether they are uh, they have a traumatic brain injury, whatever those things are. So uh, the training helps us to identify different types of mental illness. You know, currently the BLET program has about an eight-hour block in this. We, we've uh, increased that to a 40-hour class, which is taught by our local mental health providers. We have a partnership with the hospital and some of our local mental health providers that are actually helping us provide that training. And a lot of it has to do with how to de-escalate people when they, when they exhibit certain signs. So it gives the officers better tools to deal with those individuals. The, the new model is integrating communications, assessment, and tactics, uh, ICAT. And it's based on the idea that if that critical thinking the process works well for those specialized tactical units, then it'll also work well for patrol officers uh, 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 to do the same thing. Uh, uh, again, it's, uh, the person is either unarmed or has a weapon other than a firearm, uh, such as a knife, baseball bat, rocks. And that critical, that CIT training is a, is a beginning a part of uh, this uh, ICAT training. Reasons for integrating communications assessment and training. Uh, just what you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned there, uh, Councilor, uh, erratic, uh, erratic behavior, uh, uh, you know, uh, and if you hadn't gotten any of that training, what are you dealing with? Uh, uh, mental illnesses and, and I'll, the, the 40 hours that Chief talked about uh, uh, add something in the toolkit of uh, the officers to, 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 uh, to, to at least identify that. And this ICAT is a training guide that fills that gap in training for the types of dynamic and, and and potentially dangerous encounters that uh, uh, officers may run into. Uh, the nationwide uh, survey by the Police Executive uh, Research Forum, or PERF, uh, showed that uh, what we talked about earlier, that uh, they received substantial training in firearms and defensive tactics, uh, but less on de-escalation, crisis intervention, and uh, less lethal options such as uh, ECW. So a part of this is to, to, to increase that awareness of, 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 those, uh, of, of, the, of that training. ICAT uh, uh, process requires officers to ask questions. Uh, what's exactly happening? What's the nature? You know, uh, uh, to uh, both uh, uh, help in his decision-making process, uh, but also uh, to, 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 to note whether or not his decision is the, is, is the best decision at that particular point in time. This is a CDM of the critical decision-making model. Um, it's uh, logical, straightforward, ethically based. If you notice in the center, the ethics, values, proportionality, sanctity of life is all already partly ingrained in the in the in the, the force as it exists now. Uh, uh, so those are, uh, are are the core. Uh, the C this is the CDM core uh, uh, for this model. Uh, it's logical, straightforward, ethically based uh, thought process that will help officers manage a wide range of incidents effectively and safely. safely. It also uh, provides an organized way of making decisions about how they will act in the situation, uh, including the situations that involve potential use of force. All right. The five steps, uh, collecting of information, uh, uh, where you ask questions of what's going on, what, what, what am I, what, what, what do I know, what do I need to know, uh, uh, assessing the situation, the threats, do I need to make immediate action, or you know, can I look beyond the presence of what that weapon is to make some decisions, uh, uh, is this a transfer of malice? Um, uh, step three, you consider a 
police powers and agency policy, what legal authority, what what uh, legal powers, uh, what agency policies are involved in this. Uh, step four, identify options and determine the best course of actions. What am I, what exactly am I trying to achieve? Uh, do I need to wait and, uh, and collect more information? Uh, am I communicating with the subject? And uh, uh, do I need to do tactical repositioning? And step five, act, review, and reassess. Uh, after the action is taken, a question is, is there any, anything more I need to do or consider? And what lessons did I learn uh, that will help me in the next time I face a similar uh, 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 situation? And then it continues if he has to reassess. The, and, Chief. So, so we've got a kind of a timeline of where we're going with this process. Uh, the first in, in December, we're sending two officers to um, um, to New Orleans for this. This is a, the rollout, the, the national rollout for this uh, ICAT training. So we'll send two officers, two of our firearms instructors, um, and then we're going to issue and train them on a new policy because this is a drastic change from something that we've been doing for, for a number of years. And it's it's not a uh, it's not a um, uh, it's not a policy change as much as it's a culture change. It's going to take us some time to um, actually um, change the culture of the organization to to focus on this ICAT training. So um, we're looking at you know probably in September integrating that new new use of force policy with our state firearms qualification next year. So that's kind of the process that we're looking at uh, for this. I, I might add that, uh, that Colonel Lewis has been involved with a similar type of project in the Marine Corps where they, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of re-engineered this. And, you know, we've had some discussions that this is not, this is not a, you know, we're going to change this and it's, it's going to happen in, in two weeks. This is going to be a, um, this is a several-year process to get them to uh, to get every officer to understand that difference in the culture, because for, to some aspect we we have we have trained our officers to neutralize the situation as quickly as they can, and that's that's the way we've done business. And when we're dealing with people that have mental challenges, that's not always the right way. And about 50 percent of those deadly force incidents that occur nationwide, um, about 50 percent of them are related to mental health. So uh, we think that this is, uh, this is a way that we can actually continue that, that downward reduction of use of force policies. So we'll be glad to entertain any questions. Or Yes, sir. Applaud your forward thinking on these issues. <clears throat> it seems like what I gather so far, this is like classroom education. Is there some point in time where it's tied into actually role-playing scenarios? Or? You know, the, the CIT training has a full day of role-playing exercises where people actually act out particularly meant, particular uh, symptoms of mental illness. And the officers are trained to de-escalate those situations based upon those. those uh, so that's part of that, part of this whole process. The other part is that... Um, in, in, some, uh, in some aspects, we can't do this in simply in classroom training. So uh, last year, the uh, city, city manager allowed us to make a purchase for our, our training simulator that we'll be able to use that, uh, the, the, fats, or the uh, prism machine to actually do those role-playing exercises in a video type of circumstance where the officer can pull his gun or they can use their pepper spray or they can de-escalate the situation using um, using the six inches between their ears, and encouraging them to use those techniques to try to uh, to try to de-escalate the situation. I want to remind everyone: this does not mean that there will not be a police officer who, in the course of action, uh, needs to protect himself and take lethal force. What it is, though, is a program that, as was stated, it tries to make sure our officers assess the need for what level of force. As the colonel said, 
if a person is standing 20 feet away from you with a baseball bat and he's yelling and screaming and threatening to hit you, okay, he's still 20 feet away from you and, you know, the best we know, he's not a 400 baseball hitter. You need to decide what do you do in those situations. It will definitely be a process. It is not something where you take one test and you're there. Uh, this is a program, though, that we hope you agree is the direction we want our police department to go. It's a direction that we're committed to, and as the chief and the colonel said, it will take us several years to get there, but it will be through detailed, intensive, qualified training. That's good. That's good initiative. Very good. Thanks. Chief, do you know if the, um, the United States Justice Department have any type of grant funding for municipalities to to help in this process to help training? No, they, they have no grant funding for this type of training. This is this is relatively new. It's um, you know it's not a um, although in the in in England in the UK they they've used this kind of technique for a number of years because they don't carry firearms. Um, so they, they use those de-escalation techniques. So I think that, uh, I think eventually there will be. Uh, I think that, uh, that any progressive police department should be looking at, at de-escalation. And this is, uh, I think, a great model for de-escalation. Um, Colonel and I were having a discussion about the cameras this morning, the body cams this morning. And we think this is more important than the body cams because it... Uh, it teaches it teaches officers and uh, to to use um, all the information they have at their disposal to make decisions when it when it comes to to the use of deadly force and uh, I think that's that's going to be a change for uh, for the culture for the entire police culture to to make over the next several years. I think also it takes away some pressure that's inherent that, mm -hmm. you know, when these young officers respond to a scene that they have to win at that particular moment in time, which is a lot of undue pressure and stress to make those quick decisions that maybe uh, with the new training would right. just slow it down and, and say it's okay, you don't have to win at that particular moment. And, you know. and, and I'm sure the mayor could tell you, because that, that, that has been the philosophy or the culture of the organization or, or the police culture for the last several years, is you get there and you neutralize that situation as quickly as you can. And what we're saying is there are some cir cir circumstances where you have to do that, an active shooter that's, that's actually involved in the shooting. But uh, there are several circumstances, and we've seen them on TV. We've seen the, the, the videos on TV. That, it, you know, waiting back and holding back just a, a bit, you know, doing a tactical reassessment, that's not a retreat. That's a tactical reassessment and being able to actually um, engage that person so that you could de-escalate the situation. One of the things that's, that's very interesting is that when a supervisor gets on scene, the use of force incidents usually drop by about 50%. And, and, and that's because usually the supervisor slows the process down and, and is able to kind of de-escalate the situation. And I think that's, that's, that's the kind of philosophy that we want to move toward. Yeah, well, I think historically we've not really focused on that aspect of it. Now, I think this is good that we're doing this. I think a lot of these, uh, ca these events that have occurred uh, have resulted from a lack of understanding mm -hmm. on the part of the officers, you know, as far as, you know, cultural differences, act actions, and that's, you know, and some of the other things we were talking about with the mental illness, uh, but I think it's a it's an apprehension on the part of the officers that needs to be relieved somehow, and I think this is a good way to do it, is to help them understand these situations and know they have that, t that tool in the toolbox, you know, that mm -hmm. they can uh, de-escalate. And the other thing was, you know, it's just like you were saying a moment ago, you know, you know, it, it was always preached to get it done, get it done quick, fast, and gone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when the officers realized, well, that's not exactly what's expected of you, you know, that may, you know, be very helpful also. I think a good example, we sent you an email, and we're not able to talk too much about it this evening, but we used this tactic this past weekend. It took us 11 hours. I had said six in the email. Mike uh, corrected me. 
uh, he doesn't even let me do math in public. <laughs> but in an 11 hour situation, it was eventually handled and no one was injured in that situation. And that's what we're moving towards. As the mayor said, we need to make sure that the police officer understands uh, we don't expect him to get there and immediately handle the situation where it's over. We want to slow everything down, and I commend the police department for doing this. I'd also like to take just a moment. Colonel Lewis and Mike were in uh, Charleston uh, about um, three weeks ago, I believe, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And they did receive your accreditation reward. I'd like for them to give you a quick overview of that, please. Well, it was uh, the gold standard for CALEA uh, for uh, the law enforcement part of, uh, uh, of the agency. And uh, uh, the gold standard is like the highest standard that you can get for meeting the standards of, uh, of the CALEA. Uh, so uh, the, the agency is moving forward on that. And the next uh, uh, goal is for the, uh, the communications of the 911 center to be accredited uh, uh, in the near future. And I might add that, that we were accredited with excellence because based upon their inspection, they didn't find anything to uh, any, any issues with our policies and procedures. So uh, they, they had gotten rid of the flagship and they went to accreditation with excellence. So we were a flagship agency that last accreditation process and now we're accredited with excellence. So. And again, we remind everyone that the, that the mayor was the person who brought us into the accreditation era. Well done. And this Any was other? our eighth, eighth award. Right. Any other questions before we move to the next item? I have a quick question. and. I, it, it seems that a lot of elected officials are getting implicit bias training. Do you feel that that's an important training for elected officials? You know, I, I think that would be a great idea for you to, uh, for us to come in and do some of that training so you kind of understand what we're training our officers. Um, every, off every police officer has been through uh, fair and impartial policing, which is, is basically about explicit and implicit biases. So I think it would be a great thing if we put together a uh, just a, an information course on that and and did that did that for you all so you kind of understand what we're teaching our officers and how we're how we're trying to approach that. Good. Good. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Well done. Before you go, who are we on the bike cams? Well, uh, we've, we've been talking about the body cams now for, uh, um, and we, we've had, we had money in the budget to do that. The issue that, that I I'm, I'm still think that, that we're going to run into is the cost of the storage. That's going to be an astronomical cost. In fact, uh, um, Councilman Warden and I were just talking about the cameras. We're in the process of, of replacing our in-car cameras. I think the in-car cameras are more important than the body cams. Because the in-car cameras give us a, a better, broader view of what happens a lot of times. But um, the camera industry has figured out that they could charge us a fee for a licensing fee. So in addition to buying the cameras themselves, we're having to pay a licensing fee plus what the storage is. So, uh, for example, Charlotte has a million dollars for the cameras. They spend two million dollars a year on the storage. So. Uh, you know, that's going to be a, a significant, the cameras are about $1,000 a piece. We have 98 patrol officers. We would, uh, we would probably put them on every patrol officer. That's about $100,000 just for the cameras. The storage itself is one gig per officer per shift. That's going to run us about uh, two or $300,000 a year just to store that data based upon the, um, the um, attention. Retention schedule. Thank you, John. So, uh, how is it any different than the uh, vehicle cameras? Well, the storage. The vehicle cameras we have uh, we have built that into our storage ability now. So this is going to be above and beyond. And the fact that those cameras are not uh, those cameras don't run 24 or, or they don't run the entire shift. In order to capture a lot of that stuff, most of the manufacturers right now have a body cam that stays on basically all the time and it runs in a loop 
Well, there's some issues with the retention schedule on that because if we videotape it, we have to keep it. So those are things that we've got to be able to work out in order for us to act. I mean, to really afford those body cams. We'll be bringing you a detailed workshop, though. Uh, right now, it'll probably be February or even March as part of the budget. Uh, as Mike said, first thing we have been doing is making sure that the cameras we're going to be replacing with the new vehicles are the right cameras for the future and that everything is going to be uh, in the same system. You don't want to buy car cams and then three months from now decide you're buying body cams and find that they're not working together. I, I can tell you though that the officers themselves are very, uh, they, they want those, they, I think they they want those uh, those body cams. Um, because, you know, and, and the mayor can probably tell you when you put uh, the in-car cameras in, you know, those in-car cameras are much more effective at at exonerating officers than they are and and that's what makes that's why the officers are very conscious about their cameras working and making sure they work because for for the most part it helps them preserve evidence it helps them uh it helps them when people make complaints it's 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 very beneficial for them and uh the ones that test tested those cameras we the test we did several years ago or last year, they all want those cameras. They all feel that, that that's going to help them in, their, in what they do every day. The, the key for us is going to be can we afford to, to do that or not. Thank you. It's a very good presentation. Thank you. Brian? Relative to the murals, for probably two years we have generally discussed murals. You all had a series of concerns and we've been working with the Arts Council on some of those. And tonight we are going to bring forward our latest thoughts about murals. And if you're comfortable with this, then we're going to proceed with specific actions. Uh, Lily Gray and Carmela have both been working on this along with, of course, Cindy Edwards, who's with us in the background. Ryan, if you'll give an overview. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for that introduction. You actually covered two of my points that I wanted to start with. So you did, the, you did that very well since we didn't go over that specifically this morning. So, um, so we think that adding murals into the downtown area can do several things. So we want to go over kind of the purpose. We believe that it will assist with the downtown revitalization um, it will provide, similar to the, the wayfinding items that you're going to be discussing uh, this evening like you did last time, you know, places where people say, oh, that's by the mural that's X. You know, business owners can, can use it as kind of landmarks. But with that, we identified that we need uniform standards um, as it relates to the location, how they're applied, the maintenance, and how we would go about approving those murals. And we believe that um, we have done that and we kicked around several different ideas and we believe that it, it's best suited to fall within the Unified Development Ordinance and the city would review those applications through the zoning permit of process. However, there, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation, but there's some grant monies that have been received that, um, that an applicant could go through the Arts Council if they wanted to utilize some of those grant monies. But this process will establish the guidelines that they have to use regardless of whether they use the grant monies or not. So it's the same program for everybody. And the biggest part of this is that we're going to have to tweak the ordinance because right now within the downtown business zone you can have a mural as one of the three types of signage that a, a business owner can have in downtown. However, it's limited to 20% of the area. And we believe that there are some instances where 20% would not be uh, adequate size for a mural. And um, so we would look to basically strip out the signage aspect of the painted on mural type signage. And this would become a works of art mural specific to a mural versus a sign. And that's what you'll see if council decides to move forward. You'll see that basically it's revising the ordinance to eliminate these standards and create new ones as it relates to murals. We also think that um, by tweaking the ordinance, we need to establish 
an overlay district on where these murals can be located. So we have several overlay zones already, the flight path overlay, billboard, adult business overlays. This would be another one that we would add and it would basically say you can have a mural if you meet the criteria, but only if you're within these areas. We would also require standards <clears throat> such as we would require board around murals. We would limit the type of lighting, uh, no animations, things like that associated with, with the murals. What's the, uh, what's the importance of borders on the murals? It's just one of those items that we, we kind of discuss so that <clears throat> basically we can not have where the whole wall I mean, it's kind of like a frame, but we, there is a provision that would allow us, let's say that there's some shrubbery right there and they want to basically draw a tree, hypothetically, that it looks like it's coming out of the ground that we could consider allowing that to encroach within that border area. Yeah, the, but that's, the framing basically, uh, the thought of the border is to frame the mural. Now, certainly not a major, a major component, but the thought was that if these are pictures, then most pictures are framed. So to begin with, this is the areas that, that staff identified as the areas we believe the uh, mural overlay district you know, belong. Um, City Council, you may feel that, well, it needs to be expanded or shrunk, but this was basically staff's best foot forward on where we believe the mural should be located within. So this program is adopted. This is the only locations. These are the only locations that you would see murals. So this is one item that, um, and we can forward to City Council if this is something that we need to expand or, or pull back on. I don't know if that's something that we want to have Council decide on tonight or, or just something we could send to you that, that that would have to be adopted as part of the public hearing process when we bring this forward, which will likely be in February. The, the boundary is really based upon the concept of downtown revitalization and obviously focusing, focusing in two areas. One is the new bridge area right here between City Hall and the uh, middle school. And the other is the real core of downtown. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna get into the rest of the standards for, for murals. Staff basically identified that they should be on the sides of buildings. They shouldn't be on the front or the rears of buildings. And, um, but, you know, we, as a lot of things with the ordinance, we want to make sure that if there's some unique feature that we can consider that on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. So we would have some language in there that uh, would allow some adjustment based on unique situations. We would also establish how these murals would be installed, uh, materials that they would use, and ways to make sure that it's prepped properly, the quality of paint in order to create a longevity, and then maintenance. And, and within the code, it'll be more specific than this, obviously. Slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, once again, just dealing with the application of the murals on the wall. Now, the research to identify this, yes. I have to give Sandy Edwards and the uh, and the Arts Council uh, the credit. They talked to a number of places that actually allow application directly on the brick. This was this is an overview of what they recommend. You can see wire brushing. Uh, uh, polymers and acrylic paint and sealers. Yeah, so Cindy did pull other municipalities that allow mural programs and, and that's how we, we came up with these standards. So credit to Cindy, thank you for, for mentioning that, I believe. As I stated, uh, a maintenance plan requiring that um, they be maintained. There's a five-year maintenance cycle that would be established. We would do annual inspections. And if 20% or more of the mural were to become you know, deteriorated, that would basically constitute a zoning violation where we would send, you know, the owner a notice that they needed to, that they need to do something to the, the mural, either have it removed or go ahead and, and have it repaired. We have identified that the mural should follow specific themes, and we've identified, you know, whether it be something as part of Jacksonville history, the military history, local cultural diversity, 
And one of the things that we've talked about should be considered is would we allow the, the mural on the side of a building that still could display sales and or products of the business that's there at that location? So that's an item that, that we would need to define, um, you know, if it either prohibited that or would allow. So in essence, that mural in a roundabout way could meet the definition of a sign, although we would create an exempt, exemption if it's part of the downtown mural program. Now, if council says, you know, we don't want any anything advertised as far as the business that the wall is on, then we can certainly write that into the code as well. Regardless, the sales of the products would have to follow one of the permitted themes. So if they're crafty enough to identify a product or sales that they have, as long as they tie it into the theme, that would be, that would be required. Uh, this would be approved through zoning permit, so staff would review the applications. The, the owner and the tenant would have to approve the location. There would be a conceptual drawing that would be reviewed the materials that they intend to use would be provided as part of the zoning permit and how it meets the, the theme requirements. This is approved through the development service director or his or her designee. Um, we would consult with the Arts Council if we felt that there was something in question, management, legal, and then if there's any type of an approval or denial, the appeals could go to the Board of Adjustment which is typical for most of our items. And we anticipate bringing this before the Planning Advisory Board for a recommendation in July, and then this would be before you for a public hearing for a Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment that includes the overlay district and a map amendment that identifies where these um, murals could be with the overlaid zone. In January, not July. I'm sorry, January and then February. I'm ready for the summer. <laughs> Hadn't even got real cold yet. Um, there is an optional grant program. So I believe, is it 20000 or 25000 that was received? Ten. Ten? Okay. So there's grant monies that have been, uh, that have been applied for and, and received. And if somebody, I believe they're going to cap it at 5000 is the game plan. But anyhow, they could apply to the Arts Council and say, look, I want grant monies to go towards having the mural installed on the wall. It may be that they don't need the, the full amount, or it may be that they need more than that, but it's going to be, I believe it's a $5,000 cap. But that would be a separate process that would go through the Arts Council. They would still go through the city's process. It would have to meet our standards. We would issue the permit, and then they could, they could obtain the grant money. So we believe that will assist at least having one or two murals installed relatively soon because there's incentives for somebody to do that and uh, I believe this is just about um, oh as part of the grant process the Arts Council will call you know for artists to submit you know what their their education or their experience is they will select which artists that um, could, could perform the murals uh, and they'll be reviewed by a panel and interviews will happen, and then they'll notify the artists that they've been selected to participate in that if they're going to do the grant murals. So in some cases, it may be that I own a business and I have a wall, and it's identified within the overlay, and I'm okay with, with a mural being placed there, and an artist is approved, and they paint a mural on my building because I give them the green light to do so. And the owner takes responsibility for maintenance of it. Correct. <clears throat> and of course, in the process, uh, in order for any permit to be issued, there has to be uh, permission in writing from the property owner, understanding the obligations of the property owner, and also the business owner, because many times the business owner and the property owner may not be the same. So we have to get written approval. And again, I'll use an example, the bicycle gallery. They could decide that they want to pay for their own mural. They could come in, they could get a permit, and go to town painting. On the other hand, if they decide that because the cost is something they need assistance with, they would come in and go through our process for permitting, but before the permit would be issued, they would also go through the Arts Council 
to potentially get grant money. The, Art, the Arts Council uh, cannot deny the permit. They can withhold the money based upon not meeting criteria. Just concerned about our enforcement over a long-term maintenance of the thing. Just, I mean, I don't know how you do it. You know, I've been sitting here thinking of, like we do, you know, have them post a bond, but I, I think that would be kind of onerous on the uh, owners. Um, but, you know, I don't know what a, I don't know what a maintenance on a on a mural would cost. Uh, you know, is is that something that uh, that if I was the owner of the building, I'd want to know before I commit to it. What am I What am I committing to? How much of What's my financial obligation down the road uh, for this thing? What's What's it cost to to maintain a sign? How often do I have to do it? Just and and two things that we identified. Obviously, they can eliminate the mural by painting over it. And another option is if it gets to a point to where we're having difficulties with the program, as we did in the past with painted on signs, we could certainly look to amateurize and, and have them all removed if, if it doesn't meet the expectations of, of the mayor and council and, and staff. During your research, did you get any ideas of the cost of a mural? I mean, I know you talked about the cities for grants and stuff. Carmela, I didn't see you come in. Would you, would you and Cindy come up, please? My apologies. I didn't see you come in. Please join the discussion. Cost of mirror? Approximately. I mean. <laughs> uh, depending on the detail that's involved and, their, and the size of the mural, that determines cost of materials, of course, and the qualifications of the artist. A lot of it comes down to time and materials. On average, you will find smaller murals can be completed for fifteen hundred to twenty-five hundred dollars. Larger murals might be up towards the four to five thousand. I am sure that there are, you know, even larger ones that are more than that. But I'm imagining, you know, in general, for what we were thinking for the downtown area and what we've been looking at in our research, most of what we were looking at fell between the two to five range. How do you define small and large? There are cases where some communities have no, I mean, done... Like, are we talking about 10 by 20 versus 20 right. by 40? I mean, the dimensions. Some cases, in some cases, communities have done murals on doors. That's a relatively small square footage area. They've uh, painted cable boxes and different elements like that through a particular zone or area just to take something that's normally unattractive and kind of in the way and make it interesting and visual. Um, there are cases where fire hydrants or other piece, I mean just individually, you can take little things and do things with them if the community decided at large that that's what they wanted to do and if the permits allowed it. You can also do the entire side of a 10-story building. So it really comes down to what the program is designed to be, what fits the community. Um, one point of distinction on that is the difference between art in public and public art. Art in a public space is a piece of art that is put out in the public where people can see it. But the intent of public art is to really communicate the values and the who we are of a community and resonate with relevance to the location that it sits in. So the themes that you see or saw in the the guide for the program about, you know, local Jacksonville history, local military history, and cultural diversity in our community those things relate to who we are as a really international community and with a strong military presence here and the kind of story that's been told in Jacksonville prior to the 40s and since with the military being such a huge part of our lives. So by relating those pieces and then providing on the RFPs, RFQs that go out for artists, local information that will come from some community hearing sessions and I hope to get some downtown residents and downtown business owners to provide us with some photographs and local stories and background pieces that we can give to these artists so that when they're drawing designs to submit for consideration they can include that information and make it more us. Carmel, you want to add please? Um, I would just add that we have um, had extensive guidance from the North Carolina State Arts Council who has imp helped implement these type of programs in other communities and um, they've given us a good, you know, um, sense of what it would take to implement this. And we really partner with the Arts Council to ensure those that are funded with the grant money that's been obtained do have um, a sense of artistic excellence. And um, they'll help us ensure that. So. 
with the limited space that we're designating down there, did you get any survey of how many, you said you can't do the front, you can't do the back, only the sides. Looking so what's the number, seven, how many possibilities Roughly are seven. Only seven yeah. probably. I mean, you're not, you're not talking about, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, it, it, just walk with us, uh, walk down memory lane a moment. <laughs> Across the street, the side of the, of the art gallery. Mm -hmm. Now, as you move on down, the next opening would be the parking lot next door to the, uh, between the lawyer's office and the mm -hmm. city youth center. It's kind of well, locked. Yeah, right not inside. necessarily. You know, one of those may go, but we could possibly let someone paint one on our building, which is the other, you know, mm -hmm. the, the center. You walk to the corner, though, and that building, because of the way it has doors and so forth, may or may not. You walk across the street. That's actually a pretty good building there adjacent to the, uh, to the law office. Then you jump all the way down to the, uh, to the theater, the old Iwo Jima Theater. Now that pretty much covers that side of the street. On this side of the street, probably the bicycle gallery. And probably not anything else until you get all the way down to the telephone building. So if you go down to the telephone building and you look there, uh, maybe something there uh, you know, around the depot, some of those buildings have some sides that could possibly be painted. But again, you know, we're we're only talking the potential. You know, well, that's six, what I was thinking eight. of the downtown where they've done the people that have done real redevelopment, and they've made the building real nice. They're not going to want to go painting on the brand new brick that they, you know, like you think about the newer things. So it's the other know, thing I, I do want to mention. Uh, the the proposed ordinance allows you to put other material other than painting it on brick. I know Mr. Lazaro was quite concerned about that. What the what the proposed wording says: if you're going to do brick, you have to do it this way. But if you decide you want to clad the building with something else, then those techniques are also there. Cindy, one of the issues that Ryan brought up earlier is um, a determination on whether what I would call from the art perspective contextual relevance, uh, but it plays into whether it's a piece of art or a sign by a policy definition is whether or not items are included in that artwork that relates to its location specifically. Um, a good example that comes to my mind would be, you know, we're, if we're looking at military history in our local community, um, a couple sitting in 1940s era garb right after World War II sitting at a small cafe table with a cup of coffee. Well, if that happened to be near a coffee shop, that would be interesting and kind of a fun use of our history with that location. It could be advertising. It would be a draw, I think, for the business that would allow the building to be, you know, hosting such a mural. And it would also incorporate different pieces of the program's guidelines. So that's just one example of how it could relate to the location in a way that's beneficial to the business. And I know in cases like what's been done on Biagio's and other things like that, there are some painted signs already in place that relate their products, if they took that a step further and had a creative tie into our history and our community in a different way, then it would be a broader piece of art at the same time. How long, how long would a sign last until it needed maintenance? Depends. A mural. I mean, I'm just, you just curious. curious. The research that I was able to find um, in my digging around to find other communities who had applied this, you find a range of answers. Most said three to five. Um, a lot of communities had murals that they had made efforts to maintain over time. Some of them had lasted 20. If it was a mural that the community really loved and it became a huge piece of who they were and a cultural tourism draw, they wanted to keep it. So they maintained it and they coded it and it's some of them have lasted 20 years and more. But I think the average is probably more around the four to five before you're going to start seeing enough wear and tear that something's going to have to be done to maintain it. Obviously not asking for any, any final decisions tonight other then if you're opposed to it, tell us now. That doesn't mean you can't tell us later that you're still opposed to it. But there is a process that we would like to begin to go through 
with hearings before the Planning Commission and then this back in front of you for further workshops and then a further decision. Anybody have any input on it? I'm, I'm okay. So good? Okay with it? I would like to thank Carmela and Cindy for the work they've done and Lily for the work that she's done. Uh, Ryan was kind of the, the uh, pinch hitter tonight because Lily's out of town. But the ladies, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Ryan. We'll go ahead and take a recess for a few minutes and uh, come right back to the other few topics. <laughs> All right, we're back in session, and we'll go now to uh, item number three. Mayor, members of council. Mayor, members of council, as you'll recall, at your last workshop, we had a presentation by Davenport and Associates relative to certain items on circulation and improvements in the downtown area. One of the questions that came up at that time was whether the information from the joint study committee had been provided, and we found that, that it had. I'd like to begin, though, by reviewing the Joint Redevelopment Committee recommendations, review the Davenport study, and talk about moving forward. There are a lot of slides here, but we will move through them, I promise, very quickly. First of all, I will recall, I will ask you to recall that in August of 13, a workshop was specifically to report to you on the Joint City-County Downtown Redevelopment Committee's work. You'll also recall that two of our council members, Mr. Willingham and Mr. Lazaro, served along with two county commissioners, Ms. Eichner and Mr. Buchanan. There was a process that included seven planning sessions, presentations, walking tours, draft reports and recommendations were made. All of that was presented to you. Mm -hmm. At a later date, it was presented to the county commission in one of their workshops. The studies that have been done over time through the taxpayer funding these studies have all been reviewed by that committee. And the accomplishments of the downtown area were also reviewed. You can see the many, many accomplishments which have occurred in the downtown area over the years. Obviously, tremendous buildings, new businesses, things being torn down, uh, the major attractions and events that you're now having, the homes that have been built, the beautification which you have funded in the downtown area and obviously the Freedom Fountain. Another major accomplishment. And then, of course, at the August 13th or August 2013 session, at that time the county was talking about their plans. Some of these plans are now becoming a reality. The Department of Social Services is under construction, which includes the health complex. The Justice Center is now complete and courts and court needs are now being met by a new courthouse that's under construction there on Ann Street. Obviously, one of our dreams is now a reality, and that's Jacksonville Landing. And you saw a picture over the Thanksgiving holidays where I believe there were 63 uh, boats and trailers that were there. A phenomenal improvement to downtown. So there's been a lot done. The committee asked some key questions. What do we do with the waterfront? Can we underground power lines? What about Court Street? How do we improve pedestrian safety? Parking long term, how do you get private investment downtown? What options are available for funding? What incentives can we create? After all of that, the committee focused on five points. The first was, 
can we use the justice complex as an architectural example? And streetscaping on Court Street from marine to railroad. And then, of course, the key to that was underground power. The second thing they focused on was traffic analysis. They asked, what about four-way stops at Court and Old Bridge? What about reopening Court for two-way traffic? And what about the pedestrian mall? A third major focus was pedestrian safety and the installation of what the industry typically calls bulb outs or safety islands and consider wider sidewalks and landscaping. The fourth possibility of creating a square right across the street from the old courthouse. The fifth was Ann Street, creating a mixed-use waterfront district. I remember Ms. Eichner in one of what I consider to be a, a great comment. In one of our committee meetings, she said, you know, cars don't care where they park. And if you think about how we use the waterfront park there at Ann Street, Apparently, we think a lot about cars being able to see the waterfront. And of course, the other part was the possibility of creating a three-story waterfront where the justice complex and court facilities would be on the second and third floor with possible shops on the first floor. Now, unfortunately, the, let me say it in a positive way. Fortunately, the county is moving forward on Ann Street with what's going to be an extremely attractive building. However, for security reasons, they set aside the issue of allowing retail on the first floor where you have court chambers above it. Ann Street, we now have the old jail removed. It, some of it has been replaced with parking, and so some of that parking is going to be lost as the new building comes into be. Someone asked, why did we do the Davenport study? I remind you, because focal points two and three back in 2013 said we need to study things such as four-way stops, pedestrian malls, uh, reopening Court Street, new traffic patterns. So that's why the study was accomplished. The visioning that occurred I am very proud of. Part of the vision said if this is what Court Street looks like today, could we make it look like this? Or if Old Bridge Street looks like this, can we make it look like this? Or this becoming this? Or instead of having the beautiful power lines, how about undergrounding them? Now we found that underground utilities was about as expensive as building the Taj Mahal, $300,000 a block. That doesn't mean we should give up on the idea, but it is not cheap possibility of changing this intersection where it might look like this, new sidewalks, new pedestrian crossings, and the possibility of taking the one-directional part of court and making it bi-directional again with a proper uh, street pattern. We also looked at the, at the possibility of creating a downtown square. Most of you have traveled all over the country, and you know that one of the things that is so common, especially in the South, is a downtown square. So the committee looked at the block and said, how about this? Most of this block is already owned by the government. So the concept was, as the county moves some of their facilities out, why not create a downtown square? And then maybe you would see buildings, instead of facing onto Court Street only, or Old Bridge Street, Maybe some of these buildings would now face onto the square on all four sides. It's a dream, it's a vision, but that's what the committee was looking at. Working together, possibility of changing this into this. And the nice thing about it is, while the building doesn't look exactly like this, it's pretty close. That's what the county is going to be building. Working together to create a vision to develop new future and to redevelop downtown. That's what your committee was charged with doing. You gave very strong support to that. Now with that, the Davenport study, which you saw at the last workshop, I want to review with you some of their concepts and I want to talk about some recommendations. 
As you know, the general area was from City Hall all the way to Phillips or, or to uh, Popkins Bridge and was in the downtown area. And as you know, they talked about everything from Court Street to making it two-way to making four-way stops at that intersection to additional improvements on Cheney and Newbridge and then also some improvements down near the depot. Let's look at those in a different light. Court Street and Old Bridge. This is one where they said two-way stop signs really are dangerous there because of site visibility. Uh, Old Bridge Street, you know, the possibility of improving distances and vision. You'll also notice that they talked about immediately reopening Court Street, restriping it, and then at a future date possibly a pedestrian model. They also talked about Johnson Boulevard, Cheney parking realignment, Railroad Street realignment for parking, and then down near the depot, they talked about redirecting traffic a little bit, marking uh, better uh, directions. I apologize. Uh, that's the slide I should be on. Uh, that's at the depot. And then generally across the street at Bayshore, taking out that very dangerous uh, angle and redirecting traffic. Let's go back now and look at New Bridge Street. They also talked about the section from uh, basically City Hall all the way down to the Justice Complex doing some things in that area. In the area immediately in front of City Hall, they talked about possibly making it a two-way street and having it meander as you get further uh, an aerial view, you could see further down the street where you would have a two-lane section. Uh, the purple areas could be areas that people could dine in and angle parking would stay. Further down the street, I didn't realize all those were in there. Uh, let's talk about some other concepts and recommendations. This is the section from the old telephone company back up to the middle school. What they're proposing there is to meander the street and to put in some landscaping. Here are recommendations I would give. Approve the idea and authorize us to meet with the property owners and business owners. Uh, we do apologize when Mr. Bittner asked had a stakeholder meeting occurred, the answer was yes. Uh, I've never defined city staff as the stakeholders. Stakeholders are the people who own property run businesses, live in areas. So one of the thoughts relative to this section is that you authorize us to have meetings over the next several months with the business owners and property owners and get their input on what they think about that. Do they actually like the concept of having a curvilinear area? Would they rather have it straight? And if whichever way, would they like to see more landscaping going in? When it comes to the traffic circle that, is, that, the, that Mr. Davenport uh, proposed at the intersection of uh, New Bridge and Railroad, I will say to you, I would recommend denying that. And the reason why is I believe Mr. Davenport was not aware of the tremendous school bus traffic that occurs in this location. For small vehicles, even Ford F-150s, you could make this movement. But as most of you know, with the school system downtown, uh, putting this in with school bus traffic would be very, very difficult for them to make that maneuver. While you could eliminate the traffic light, I'm not so sure that that is something that you would want because of school bus and, and larger truck traffic. Now, as you go further down from the proposed roundabout all the way down to the Justice Complex, we would recommend the same thing there meet with the property owners and businesses regarding improvements there. There are, if it's hard to believe, but there are more businesses in that two, I'm gonna call it two block area downtown than any other area really downtown. Now I'm not talking about the part here in between the middle school and us. And we really do need to do something with the sidewalks and some of the uh, areas there. It is a very wide curb to curb face. So you could put in nice landscaping, improve the parallel parking. It's only a two way street today. 
So again, one of my recommendations is authorize us to meet with the property owners and businesses regarding landscaping and how we can move forward there. When it comes to Johnson, a lot of this is already done. You'll remember that when the DOT resurfaced it, what, Anthony, two years ago? Two or three years ago. The striping and lane diets have already occurred. And you'll also remember that the center medians have already been marked out. The DOT was not willing nor able financially to install landscaping at that time. But at some future date, I would like to see us consider putting in landscaping in the green area shown in the graphic. And I will say that's going to be a number of years away because there are certainly other priorities for your CIP. So again, number five has been accomplished. Number six is something we should think of for the future. When it comes to Cheney, this is basically where A and B Tire is. This is where the Piers group is, and there are several businesses there. This is a very wide street. To improve the availability of parking, you could certainly put in angle parking on the side where Piers is located. You could mark the parallel parking on the other side where the homes and vacant lots and so forth are, and you would simply move the center line as shown in this graphic. Our recommendations here are approve the pavement marking. Now, that won't be this coming week, but if you like the concept, we'll work it into budgets over the next year or so. Railroad Street, we looked at Railroad Street from basically the uh, area behind Biagio's all the way back to uh, past the funeral home, all the way up to Cheney. Because that area is really uh, not changing much at this point, we don't see a need to do a lot as far as restriping. So our recommendation there would be delay any action in that area and as we see future redevelopment occurring, then we can look at how we create more parking. But to go to the expense of creating parking in that area today, you're not getting much benefit, in my opinion. When it comes to the area at the depot, there is no question that you have an abundance of asphalt, especially on the depot side and the business side of this intersection. And you can see that what Mr. Davenport was recommending is proper striping along railroad for parking, both parallel and angle, and also the installation of some medians and addition of color. We think that that's a good idea. We would recommend that you approve marking the parking and installing the lane dividers. Again, that won't be this coming week. It will be something we'll have to put in the budget. When it comes to the area generally across the street, you will notice um, in, in the aerial, the city hall is, uh, is not quite on the, uh, on the map here, but you will notice this is the triangle. There are a lot of site visibility problems here. The proposal is to close the street as it angles in from the red light and to make it a T intersection. But what we would encourage is this, that we meet with the neighboring property owners and receive their feedback. If they're not in favor of it, there's no need for us to do it. So if the feedback is positive, then we'll look out at the CIP of possibly 2019 and see something like this installed. The critical thing, though, is there are several businesses there that you're going to have to make sure that they have access once you redesign that intersection. So the recommendation, meet with the neighbors and property owners, feedback's positive, move forward. When it comes to Court Street, recommendation would be to approve a four-way stop, approve opening Court Street for two-way traffic, table pedestrian plan pending redevelopment. I have said to you before that you're to be commended for moving forward with moving the homeless shelter and the soup kitchen. Council Community Outreach would not be where they are today if this council had not provided the money. However, until we see the homeless shelter and the soup kitchen move, there is no need for us to spend any money in that block relative to a pedestrian mall. 
And I would also say to you that while we are tabling that, we're not tabling some of the other ideas. A four-way stop there, that is a dangerous intersection. Anybody who, whether you're walking or whether you're in a car, uh, crossing at that area is a dangerous thing. Recommend again approving the four-way stop, approve the opening of court for two-way traffic, and then table the pedestrian plan until redevelopment. Newbridge Street Concepts. Mr. Davenport recommended a roundabout, generally at the post office, and then you can see the curvilinear pattern which we discussed before. Another angle of what he is proposing. I would also remind you that in 2013, the city, using MPO money, came up with four other concepts. Concept A was to take the four-lane section, leave the angle parking and the curbs where they are, to put in a median in the middle, and reduce it to two-way traffic. And in the median, what you could do is a series of landscaped activities. You could also set them up where they were short landscaping where delivery vehicles could park in between some of these. The, the <coughs> design is something that we could be very fluid with. But again, concept A would be to change it from four lanes to two lanes, leave angle parking, and to put the center median. Concept B was to leave the two center lanes, not put in a median, expand the sidewalk significantly, and move the angle parking out. In that, what you would see are much wider sidewalks and, of course, angle parking. Concept C was very similar to A, except it put in parallel parking. And concept D... So here are examples of parallel parking with the center median and the, and the two lanes. Concept D was very similar to concept B, and that is no center median but parallel parking. I would say to you, number one, we need to meet with the business and property owners. We're fortunate we have several of them here tonight, but we need to engage them more. Second thing, in that meeting, I would suggest that we discuss the Davenport concept and concepts A and B. I would recommend we reject concepts C and D due to parallel parking. I know you can buy a Ford and other cars today that will parallel park themselves, but most people have a difficult time parallel parking. Plus the fact you're going to lose a lot of parking by making it parallel parking. So the recommendation is meet with the business owners and property owners, review concepts for Davenport and A and B, but reject concepts C and D. The other recommendation that we would suggest is across the street in front of the arts area, we have installed the first pedestrian safety island with landscaping. We currently have in the budget about $50,000 and we would recommend that we proceed to install additional safety medians because that will not be wasted money, but it can begin us towards that process. Using city crews, landscaping and all, and not including their labor or the equipment, but I think you'll agree that if you look at that quality work, it really beautified that area. The total cost was just under $5,000. So those are my recommendations, is look at installing, going ahead over the next several months, as Johnny can work it into his schedule, we'll put in another, and we'll put in another, we'll put in another. What about the roundabouts? You ask for information regarding that. Now, the nice thing about my job is I don't have to do anything except talk to y'all, but I have a staff who can do a lot of work in between the times we talk together. So Anthony looked up information from the USDOT. Roundabouts, I will say, they come in all sizes and shapes. You can have little tiny traffic circles. 
You can have great big circles like they have in Germany and some of the places in the United States that are true roundabouts. You can go out on the base here, and there are roundabouts. The important thing is the geometry and the traffic. If you don't get the diameter of that circle to properly match the traffic volume, it will not work. You can make it as beautiful as you want, but it isn't about beauty. The function is based upon diameter and volume. From the accident report, what we have found is roundabouts 300,000 signalized intersections in the United States. About one-third of the intersection fatalities occur there. About 2,300 deaths every year, and about 700 of those are from people running red lights. Now, that's nationwide. Roundabouts, according to the DOT, have demonstrated substantial safety and operational benefits. 78% reduction in injuries and fatalities and 48% reduction in overall crashes. DOT of North Carolina. There are 30 places in the state of North Carolina where signalized intersections have become roundabouts. Crash data shows this. Of the total crashes, there's been a 46% reduction from before when they were traffic lights to where they are today. The conclusions, total crashes are down, injuries are down, frontal impact crashes are down. What did Mr. Davenport say about it? Here is one of the, one of the graphics which I think demonstrates. If you look at the left, a roundabout results in eight vehicle conflict points. A typical intersection has 32. And here's the difference in the crashes. I'm sorry. Here's the difference in the crashes. You can see that roundabouts almost always are side swipes. Somebody not yielding to the car that was already in the circle. Now, that doesn't mean that we should start installing roundabouts all over the community. If you haven't been back behind the community college and come into their new entrance off of Country Club, I encourage you to do that. They have installed a phenomenal roundabout that has mountable components and beautiful landscaping, but the key is it matched the diameter of the circle and the volumetrics that that circle was designed to handle. We think that right here at the post office, now, here's a graphic of our post office, right? No. I have no idea where College Street and Oak Street are, but the interesting thing is, look at the angle of the road coming in from the bottom. This is almost the same geometrics that we have next door to City Hall. Now, I'm not saying we should build this. What I am saying, though, is I think we need to give that more study doesn't mean in the end that we're going to recommend installing it. <coughs> so those are the recommendations. That's the background from the joint committee. Uh, what we'd like to do is open it up for a few minutes of discussion, but really come back uh, in January or February, uh, you know, with more discussions. The one thing I am asking, though, tonight is this. Do you have any objections if we proceed to set up neighborhood meetings with the property owners? We'll do it in small groups. Because to me, the people between here and the middle school, we need to have a meeting specifically to talk about them. Then we need another group, and then we need another group. So do you have any problems if the staff moves forward with getting additional public input from the stakeholders? Everybody good? Okay. I do want to commend, again, uh, Mr. Willingham and Mr. Lazara and the two county commissioners who took the time to put together the study that was now three years ago. Uh, a lot of good ideas have come from that. Richard, if I may mention, as part of you moving forward with the uh, study part of it, we may want to look at some of the old plans that we paid for to see how those thoughts back then you know, could apply now, you know, the Allison Platt study and the Lawrence group, 
There may be a lot of similarities, maybe not, but I think since we paid for them, we may should look at them and try to incorporate. Well, some actually, they have been incorporated in these ideas. Awesome. So, but we will, when we meet with the public, we'll have those studies there. And the other thing I wanted to add was on base, you know, they had the, the, the traffic circle and um, they updated it some years ago. But the old way I thought was a lot safer than the new way because the old way was just a single and then they added the double that you can go around and it uh, the dynamics of the circle changed just by that change because you got a two lane people going in people going out shifting lanes within the circle because they're trying to get to a if you ever get a chance to go out there that would be a good one to look at well just I, to, I have been through that I will tell you the more lanes that you put into a traffic circle, the more complicated they become, the less friendly they become. And that's why I will say to you, a traffic circle is not the panacea in every location. It, it has to fit the right location. It wouldn't work at Western and Marine Boulevard. It no. definitely would not work at Western and Marine Boulevard. <laughs> hey, I, sure. I, I'm kind of curious about why you would suggest a roundabout here at New Bridge Street right here, but then several blocks down the road you said the buses. The geometrics are better. The, the distances that okay. you have to work with. You know, if you look down at, uh, at the old telephone company, uh, you just don't have a lot of area there. I see. Okay. But out here, you know, you have, uh, you have uh, 48 feet of lane, and then you have another 24 feet of parking space on each side. So, you know, 48, I'm around off to 50. So you're dealing with, you know, Gail, where are you? 72 <laughs> feet of distance. Whereas down there, you're not dealing with anything like that distance. What do we, uh, when the new courthouse addition is done, we're certainly going to increase the uh, capacity by adding an, an additional, at least one or one or two additional court courtroom spaces. Parking is going to be even worse than what it already is and we're certainly not creating any any new parking spaces uh, you know, that parking deck we talked about uh, a couple years ago maybe sooner rather than later i think i think there's going to be a need for increasing the parking down there because of that courthouse stuff i, I agree with you i would also remind you that that this council is currently uh, the funding source for the parking lot that's going to add about 50 or 60 spaces there uh, where the tax office used to be, and the city council purchased the old uh, Beecham and um, Ward Ward property on across from the depot there on uh, Court Street. So at a future date, we can add parking. But uh, you're correct; we need to constantly look for opportunities for parking improvements. We can always go up with parking too. Yeah. Well, what we continue to find is that. Uh, uh, parking structures, eighteen to twenty-one thousand dollars per space. Surface parking continues to be somewhere in the vicinity of five to eight thousand dollars per space. I think every time the city has an opportunity to buy land in the right location that can add to your parking for the future, you should consider doing that. Anything else on that before we move to the last agenda item? Okay. Wayfinding program. At the last council meeting, we also, or the last workshop, we also talked about uh, wayfinding and the work that the TDA was doing. Wayfinding is actually a joint effort of the TDA and the city council. Why is that? Well, first of all, TDA is the one that's funding it. But secondly, you're the ones who have the voting power. You're the ones who have to approve what gets done in the city. So I consider this to be a joint effort. And one of the things that we're going to do tonight is begin the process that we hope will create a dialogue that will help us move forward with this program. The workshop is going to focus on these three things, wayfinding directional information signs, site-specific signage, and gateway features. Now, I will tell you that if you pull out the manual, which the TDA paid for, they don't use these terms. I like these terms because they're pretty simple. Everybody can understand what a directional information sign is. I think everybody can understand what a site-specific sign is. And we all know what a gateway feature is. 
There is a very detailed booklet that came with the TDA study. It talks about layouts, it provides design, it sets up locations, and it specifies the material. Now that doesn't mean it's like any consultant study, it is a study with recommendations. It does not mean you have to go with the recommendations. The first thing we want to talk about though are the wayfinding directional information signs. Here's an example. This is out at Coastal Carolina Community College. These are directional and informational signs. Almost every block, almost every turn in the roads out there, you find directional and informational signs. You also find these types of directional and information signs. So when we talk about the directional information component, we may not be talking specifically about this sign, but I'm giving you examples of what we're talking about. Other communities have done it different ways. They've mounted them on the light poles. They've created their own poles. They've created just a whole variety of styles, some on two pedestals, some on one pedestal. You can see Canapolis, what they have done. I'm going to go back to the second. And you can see the scale. Now, these at Canapolis are very, very large. The directional proposed signs out of the study are, are this, where they would be on a single pedestal. They would have, in most cases, uh, directional information on one side. You will notice that it has the TDA logo at the top, which I know several of you made comments about, but you can also see that it shows eras going to specific locations. The manual looked at the entire city and literally recommended, you know, oh, I don't know the exact number, I'm going to say 100 locations for these things to go in. Because what are you trying to find? You're trying to find the hospital, the library, the courthouse, the city hall, the, you know, uh, Jacksonville High School. You know, what, there are so many places, the commons. And when you get to the commons, where is the EOC? Where is the, uh, you know, where is the... Uh, uh, Lake Bittner. Lake Bittner. That, that's a good one. But these are signs that I think, you know, need to be put up pretty soon. Now, you all need to decide, you know, with the TDA, is this the exact sign you want? But this is what information and directional wayfinding is about. You can also see another example. These would most likely be in locations where you have a lot of, of walking and pedestrian traffic, not vehicular traffic. Again, good examples. What about location-specific signs? This is a good example of what a location-specific sign is. It's basically a sign that identifies where your business is. Now, over the last several years, we have seen going from pole signs to this type of monument sign. As far as location-specific proposal, what they are proposing is at the commons that we build a sign like this that recognizes the Jacksonville Commons. Why is that? When you are at a hotel or a motel or you're at a restaurant and you're trying to find the commons for one of the events that's there, good luck. I mean, you know, we have a forest of almost a thousand feet between there and Lake Bittner. So when you get to Lake Bittner, you, you build this sign out on Western. It has the ability to have a changeable message board so you can say, Everything from volleyball tournament to uh, Bittner Pickleball Incorporated and national tournament there. But you put that at the corner. Now, I have to admit, that may not be the exact dimensions because that sign makes it look like it's 50 feet tall, mm -hmm. and we don't allow signs quite that tall here. But that's a good example. Here are other examples. What about out at the Lejeune Memorial Garden? Right now we have a four by eight sheet of plywood that has the words up there. We need a proper sign out there, location specific. And maybe what you do is have one type sign on 17 and another type sign on the bypass, or both the same. Other communities 
have uh, have incorporated that very successfully. On wayfinding gate on the wayfinding gateway signs, here's what we have today. They've been there a long time. These are the this was the what I'll call fad or most uh, uh, the most sought after example years ago. They're basically sandblasted signs. Here's the one entrance to downtown, out at Camp Lejeune on 24, at Gum Branch. And here's the one somewhere. Now, I'm not sure whether this was because of, um, of mm. earthquakes that the sign shifted further and further away from the visibility. But these are your entranceway signs today. Here's some options. This is what the infant of Prague has. You'll notice it's a combination of brick and landscaping and granite. Here's right across the street at the First Presbyterian Church. You have brick, you have nice landscaping, you have a changeable panel, and you have, I believe that's a plastic uh, component. Coastal Carolina, these are their new signs. You notice the architectural features. You also notice that the blue that says Coastal Carolina, and that blue is tied into the theme of each of their directional information signs. While the product is different, meaning there's brick here and there's metal in other locations, they've carried the theme of the blue through. Here's another example. This is right at the entrance uh, of Popkins Bridge and Phillips Bridge. You could build a very nice brick facility there. Other communities have done a lot of amazing things. I really like that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Some are pretty simple. The gateway sign that's proposed, and please don't look at the wording. We're not, we're not looking at the wording. The, the consultant recommended this. It's a combination of brick and a combination of, uh, I guess, a metallic panel. And you can generally see the dimensions there if you have very good idea, uh, very good eyes. But um, we can get you the details on that. You will notice it has the city seal, it has the TDA seal, it has words. Now, at a future date, we need to talk about whatever sign you build. What words do you want on it? I know several of you have said to me that you feel that we should continue to show home of Camp Lejeune and New River Air Station. There are various opinions about the wording. What we do know is that there are two locations we can recommend continuing to have these gateways. The one coming in from Gum Branch is a good location that's very visible. And the one coming in from 24 and Swansboro right at the railroad tracks, still a great location. These are not intended to show you where the city limits line is. These are your welcome signs. There are two locations, though, that we need to rethink. One is definitely out coming in from New Bern. We got to find a place to put it. Personally, I'd love to see these things put in the median so they're very visible. Problem is DOT standards. On the other hand, if we're not going to put it in the median, we're going to have to figure out how to get the land to place it on. And then the other end is right there at the confluence of Old Bridge and uh, Marine Boulevard. Do you put it where the current one is? Well, you might if you use a certain design, but you wouldn't if you use a different design. So those are two areas that we would say to you, we're not so sure that's where you're going to put the signs. In the end, we know that the TDA has set aside $450,000 for the project. We also know that their, their priorities, as they recommended, are this way. Get busy on the directional information signs. Get busy on the site-specific sign for the commons. And then have the gateway signs at a future date, whatever money may be left over. I will tell you, the gateway signs, depending on what you pick, they could be relatively inexpensive, $10,000. They could be relatively expensive, fifty or sixty or $70,000. You know, these, these are structures, and therefore they have to be designed and they cost money to build. 
here's what we'd like to recommend. Let's proceed with the directional information signs. Let's proceed with the site-specific signs. And let's continue discussion of the gateway signs at the January 17th meeting or later. On the other hand, all of this, you know, we, you have access to. What we can do is discuss all of this at January 17th. The bottom line, though, is this. The TDA has spent the money for a good study. We need to move forward. You need to move forward as the elected officials, giving the TDA confirmation, yes, we like this, no, we don't like that. If you don't like the sign they're proposing, they need to be told. If you don't like the words, you need to be told. But being at stalemate or just not discussing it doesn't help any of us. So those are my recommendations. I appreciate your listening ear tonight, and I believe that you have nine minutes left. So any comments before we close out the workshop? Councilman, any comments? Mr. Warden? Just, uh, you know, I don't, we, we obviously don't have time to discuss it before the meeting. I wonder, do we want to try to continue in after, after, like you proposed? We can certainly do you, that. You proposed that, uh, and, I'm, and I'm okay with that. What would we do in the 17th, then? Are we trying to do no, no, I wouldn't. I, I'm just trying to trying to give some direction on, the, on at least on the first couple items. Okay. That would be my, my thought. Man, I'm fine with the hell I think we need a, we more, need more than eight minutes or seven minutes, whatever we're at left to. Yeah, to, to have a good discussion, we either need to come back after the city council meeting tonight or move it to the 17th or to February. Uh, but we do need, I mean, this was not intended for y'all to say, go do it. We need to have dialogue. How, how uh, timeline, do we need to meet tonight or are we okay with, with setting it up on the 17th? There is no time schedule other than the fact we need to do this sooner than later. Mr. Lazaro, you're the head of the TDA. Uh, I do, and if we can, I mean, obviously, we can, we've can. waited this long. We can wait if that's what the desire the is. But, um, you know, I think that we're at a point that we would like to move forward. We have the funding set aside. There's a need. Um, as I was telling the mayor earlier, when you look at Coastal Carolina Community College, it's it's when they did the signage package it just totally changed the dynamics of the college that just and, in its that and, and, and put in the the, the walkways they, oh, they yeah. connected all I mean, the walkways it's, it's made it much much nicer but you're right that's so and i really like the design of, you know, beautiful design. beautiful design beautiful and it, design. it appeals a whole lot more to me than what i was what i'm seeing from this you know study but well and, and even when you saw those designs, anytime you look at designs, they don't show the pure element of when it actually gets constructed. So there is some some vagueness there. But all in all, we would like for us to move forward with these projects because they don't happen overnight, as you know. It takes some time, even after when you know when we do decide. But uh, we feel that. Um, you know, we're, we're ready to listen, and I even mentioned to Richard I would like to have a future workshop and just sort of talk about TDA and, and, you know, where we've been, where we've come from, what we've done, how we're regulated, just sort of, you know, remind us all of who we are and what we're doing and make sure we're going in the right direction and that, um, and that we're communicating properly. So... Uh, that was a recommendation that I gave to Richard earlier. So we'd like to do any and all of that. So at your pleasure, we can continue it today or... What is the pleasure to council? You want to wait to resolve uh, the rest of this or do you want to do it tonight? Mr. Willingham. Wait since we have a closed session. Okay. Mr. Bender. That's fine with me. Mm -hmm. okay. so I think that's... Uh, so Thank you very much. Thank you. Without uh, any further ado, I will entertain a motion for uh, a second. Adjourn. Adjourn. All in favor? All in favor? Uh,